My name is Sean McQuaid, and I am the president of the St. Petersburg Bar Association. And it is my honor today uh, to be participating in the Florida Jurist Recognizing Hispanic Excellence event featuring our own Judge Ir uh, Miriam Irizarry. Your Honor, good morning. Thank you for uh, appearing with me. It is my honor and pleasure to be conducting this interview with you. Good morning, Sean. It's really good to be here with you, and thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to go through a series of uh, questions with you today to learn more about your background, learn more about the challenges that you faced um, throughout the course of your life, and also what you see, what you experienced on the bench, and what you see uh, moving forward for um, for the community here in St. Petersburg and the greater Pinellas County. Um, First off, uh, obviously, I know that you are uh, our only Hispanic judge on the bench here in Pinellas County. So, um, and I understand that you are going to be retiring soon. So, uh, with that being said, uh, I just wanted to thank you at the outset uh, for your dedication to the community, your service to the community, and your just ex excellence on the bench. We are all going to miss you, although this is. Um, the end of your uh, your career as a judge, I hope that you will continue to be there for all of us and continue to give back to the community in the years to come. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And uh, it is an exciting time, uh, although I will miss all of my uh, colleagues on the bench, all the lawyers and the people, the, but I, I do look forward to uh, a new chapter in my life. Right. Sounds bittersweet, right? Bittersweet. <laughs> well, in any event, let's get started with the interview. Um, first, what can you tell us about your family's, you know, national and cultural background? All right. So I uh, was born in Puerto Rico uh, and uh, in a small town called Cubuy, the mountains of Puerto Rico. I uh, was... Um, my mom, uh, she was a single mom, and so there were seven of us, and we uh, grew up in a, in a little shack in Puerto Rico, and uh, it was uh, a very difficult time for us. My mom, my, uh, my dad left us when we were all very small, and uh, so imagine the challenges of, uh, of living in this small shack where there was like no running water or no electricity, and so, you know, we had a fogón, which is uh, four rocks where you cook the, the food, and then we had an outhouse that we called the latrina, where you, you know, that's, that's where you go out back, and there was a creek that ran behind the shack, and that's where we got our water, and pretty much, as far as food, we ate what we could grow on the land, and uh, so it, it, it was pretty dire to begin with. Yeah, it sounds, uh, sounds um, trying, to say the least. Um, so how was it that you, uh, that you left Puerto Rico? Um, so my mother's uh, aunts, my mother's brothers and sisters had uh, moved to New York City. And so one of the uncles came to visit and, you know, saw our conditions. And so he convinced my mom um, to uh, move to New York. And so my mom sent my oldest sister first to sort of pave the way for us. And my oldest sister, uh, she uh, went to work at a feather factory in New York. She earned some money. And um, so then she uh, sent for my mom and the three youngest of us. And so <clears throat> we all uh, left Puerto Rico. We had to separate from our other brothers and sisters to have to stay behind with family members. and. You know, we were so close as a family that that separation was very painful. But uh, we uh, moved to uh, New York City. Uh, the first building that we moved to in the tenement slums of New York City, that building burned to the ground. And um, so here we were uh, homeless now, <laughs> pretty much. And so uh, my uh, brothers and sisters, we all had to go to different family members uh, who lived in New York at that time. And so we were separated once again. And, uh, you know, my mom, she continued to work really hard with my sister at that feather factory. By then she had joined my sister there in the factory. And so they were able finally to um, 
get enough money together to uh, pull the family together. And uh, eventually we moved to the Lower East Side of New York City where we sort of found our, our permanent home. It was a, a, an apartment on the sixth floor of a building that had no elevator, so imagine. And um, so that's, those were some of the challenges that we faced early on. Um, you know, my mom, she didn't, I mean, she tried to just take care of us. And when, um, you know, the realization hit that she had to get us to school and do all these things, um, we, um, she was encouraged to go on public assistance so that she could stay home and work uh, and uh, take care of us instead of work. And so, and so we went on public assistance. At the time, it was called welfare. <laughs> and, um, you know, she had to go to a lot of different social service agencies to get that all lined up. So she would take me with her and I would interpret because I picked up the language a lot quicker. You know, as a child, you pick up the language quicker. And so she thought I was her little advocate and that's where the lawyer dream started. Um, she, you know, uh, from that day on, kept telling me, you're gonna be a lawyer, you're gonna be a lawyer. And, um, and that's how the dream started. And she helped uh, plant the seed, it sounds like. Yes. That's yes, she did. So was there someone or something in your upbringing that, was, that you felt was particularly helpful to you in getting where you are now uh, today? Uh, well, I think it was <clears throat> our, our life was all about overcoming challenges and persevering despite all odds. I mean, how uh, in the world would I ever even think about going to college or law school, you know, being born in that little shack and then all the challenges that we faced in New York City um, that, that I could even think about going to college or law school. But, you know, it, she, you know, my mom, I keep going back to her because she was a rock and she was fierce and she was a strong Puerto Rican woman who was not about to give up on, on the dream for e that she had for each of us. And um, so uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we were able to move from New York um, to New Jersey and then eventually Florida. And, uh, and so in New Jersey, when I was in high school, I was not even in the right college uh, track. Um, and so the Upward Bound program, which was a program designed to get minority students into college came to our school and um, they directed me to a college curriculum and helped with uh, secure financial aid. And so before I knew it, I was uh, uh, going into Rutgers College in, in, in New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey. And it, had it not been for a program like that and for all of the encouragement and motivation and and just persevering through that, I, I probably would not have found my way to college. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, after I finished college, there was another program called the CLEO program. And that program was also designed to help minority students get into law school. And so they helped me get to Rutgers Newark Law School. And uh, so thank goodness for programs like that, for tuition aid, programs and grants and student loans and those types of things that I was able to go to law school and, uh, and uh, graduate. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, uh, that, that background. I mean, I know that's an extreme <clears throat> set of circumstances. It can't be, um, it's got to be difficult to be sharing that much uh, personal information, but I know we appreciate it and it does really explain uh, who you are and the foundation of who you are as a person. Uh, I'd like to switch a little bit to um, cultural diversity on the bench. Um, do you believe it's important to have cultural diversity on the bench? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, as judges, we, the bench needs to represent the makeup of our community. And uh, when people, we have people from all walks of life coming before us. <clears throat> and when, uh, People walk in, they need to see a face that they can identify with. They need to know that they are also part of, of this system. And so uh, we, we, we need to have uh, judges that represent the makeup of our community. I, I strongly believe in that, yes. 
Uh, do you believe that there are special challenges or considerations that culturally diverse candidates may face when seeking appointment or election to the bench? Uh, yes, there are many challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, the nomination process as well as the uh, election process, they're difficult processes to navigate. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it requires a lot of hard work. And then once you get through the process, uh, it, it, it requires uh, staying the course and uh, continuing forward. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the election process is a very expensive process. And so it requires a lot of strength, a lot of perseverance. It requires uh, a lot of hard work. It requires a, making a, a lot of, of connections uh, um, to, to help you get through the process. So the challenges are many because it's not an easy process. And so the key is to uh, encourage diverse candidates to take on that challenge and to, and to not, not, not let it go. I mean, it took me several tries before I was appointed by uh, the governor. And so it's all about perseverance and staying the course and staying with it. Right. In fact, um, you're probably in a, a very unique situation to comment about the challenges of the process since not only did you have, you went through the appointment process, but then you ran for re-election and you had a challenger, which obviously you're ultimately successful, but uh, yes. <laughs> luckily for all of us. But uh, yeah, so you're in a unique situation. You've been through both of them uh, to be able to comment on that. So that's, I think that's, that's very interesting. So what, let's get back to the first time that you went through the, uh, the, the nomination process. What, what was the foundation? What what motivated you to change your career uh, to become a judge? First, if you could tell us what you did before, what role you served in, and then what motivated you to become a judge? Uh, well, first of all, I always, because of everything that I went through as a, you know, growing up, I, I wanted to always um, do public service work. So there was never this idea that I was gonna become a lawyer and do anything other than public service work. So I um, um, started out with uh, the Legal Services Corporation in New Jersey, helping indigent people with civil matters. And then I went to the Public Defender's Office and, and uh, did the criminal uh, work there. And, uh, and then uh, when I left there and, and uh, moved um, to Florida, I um, went to work for the um, works office um, because I also love to teach. And so I, I taught as an adjunct at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And so when I moved here, uh, the works office had a position for uh, teaching uh, the court clerks criminal law and procedure. I jumped on it, it was wonderful. And so uh, my career just expanded from there in the works office. I became in-house counsel for the clerk of court. And so I served in that capacity. Um, so then, um, I, um, of course, I love the law and I always wanted to be able to get back uh, into um, uh, more of my public service work. And so I started applying for the judgeship um, because, you know, with uh, being a judge, you really impact the lives of so many people on a day to day basis. And while there are some, you know, while there are restrictions in the things that you can do as a judge, there's still plenty of opportunity um, to, to help people as they come through the process, keeping the neutrality, but at the same time, having that uh, empathetic ear, uh, listening and identifying really with the issues that come before you. And um, so that's, that, that was my transition to the judgeship. Thank you. What, what was it like to be Pinellas County's only Hispanic judge when you first got appointed? appointed? <laughs> uh, well, you know, for the community, it was a big celebration. I am actively involved with uh, uh, an organization, uh, well, many, many organizations, but the Hispanic Outreach Center is, is a big uh, center where uh, uh, we serve uh, the, the uh, Hispanic population of Pinellas. And, um, so there was great celebration uh, to know that 
they had a Hispanic judge on the bench and that in some way, shape or form, I had opened a door there. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, for, for me and my family, uh, it was just probably the most wonderful day of my life at the investiture. Uh, it was uh, uh, a great beginning. Uh, so since you've been on the bench, have you seen anything change in terms of diversity in Pinellas County, either uh, you know, from your, your, your fellow judges? Um, can you comment on that? Uh, well, you know, sadly, in Pinellas County, um, I'm the only Hispanic judge. We have 69 judges, and we have a, a handful of African-American judges, and um, we um, just um, recently, uh, I was happy to see that uh, an Asian American judge uh, have, uh, has been appointed to, to our bench. And so uh, I see it growing little by little, slowly, uh, but I, I don't think that we have made uh, the progress uh, that uh, I would hope we would have made um, by, by this time, uh, especially given uh, the, uh, Hispanic population that has just exploded in Pinellas County. And um, so I think we need to do uh, more, more work in that area. Understood, thank you for that. So over the course of your lifetime, obviously you've had um, many different experiences. You've served in many different roles. Have you ever experienced or witnessed discrimination either personally against yourself or maybe family members or friends? And if so, what have you learned from those experiences? Uh, well, certainly growing up, uh, myself, my family, we experience uh, discrimination in uh, many forms. Um, everything from housing to education to, um, um, you know, just uh, um, very difficult. And um, so what you learn from those experiences is that uh, it builds um, strength of character and it builds um, a, a sense of urgency in you to know that you have to uh, work really hard to overcome those types of things. And uh, so you have to build grit and you have to, um, you know, put those things aside and know that, that you are um, just as good as the next person. And that if you have a goal and you're focused on that goal, uh, just like I was focused on mine, that, that, that you can overcome those challenges and persevere. Um, so I think that uh, those are important uh, lessons to uh, help others uh, overcome those things. And, you know, you, you see some of these discriminatory things a little bit more so subtle now. Uh, but but they're still there, and so it's important for um, us to be able to teach our, our our young people how to overcome those struggles and persevere to pursue their goals. Well said, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about um, your role on the bench and what you've observed from other uh, members of the judiciary. What qualities do you believe are important for judges to have? All right, in addition to the qualities um, that we all think about when we think of judges, uh, first and foremost, I think a judge uh, has to bring humility to the bench. And, and, and uh, each of us, we bring our backgrounds with us to the bench. And so, uh, you know, for me, um, that humility was very important um, because uh, first of all, you should never forget where you came from. And, um, the humility helps you to identify with the problems uh, that are coming before you, having an empathetic ear and really listening to what people are saying. Everyone that comes before you, they, they want to tell you lots of things. And so it's important for us to, you know, to listen. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I know we have to get through the docket, so you have to decipher through everything. But having people leave that courtroom know that they were respected, that they were heard and that despite whatever the resolution was, um, that, that, they, that they did feel that they had their day in court. And so 
you know, it takes a lot of different components, the whole component of fairness and empathy and all of those things in order to um, uh, come out at the end with a just resolution. Obviously, this event is being put on by the Bar Association, so there's a, uh, a networking element associated with Bar Associations. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that networking is beneficial to lawyers in our, in our profession? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I uh, have been actively involved uh, with uh, the St. Pete Bar Association, the Clearwater Bar Association, the Voluntary Bar Associations of our area. Uh, and I uh, encourage our uh, young attorneys to get involved very early on because that is where the rubber hits the road. I mean, that is where you network. That is uh, where uh, you uh, make your, your, your friendships and everything else. And, and um, so involvement, I mean, uh, not just um, going to a luncheon here or there, although that's good, but like really involved. And so uh, for me first, I was involved with the community law program through the foundation um, and at the Clearwater Bar, the, the Clearwater Bar Foundation. And so after that, I got involved in committees with the bar until eventually I became the president of the Clearwater Bar. Uh, another little milestone there because that, that was the Clearwater Bar's first uh, Hispanic uh, president. Um, and so, um, that helped me tremendously to get my judgeship because you know being president of the bar uh as you are sean you know it shows great leadership and it shows that your colleagues trust you and they believe in you in your leadership and and, and that you can uh move the bar association forward and so uh i i think it's very important uh particularly if if you know you aspire to the bench I remember when you became president of the Clearwater Bar, and I know that you practice what you preach. I know that you get your hands dirty and that you are doing the hard work, uh, not only on the bench, but, you know, leading up to that. And I, yeah, I, I, I specifically remember when you were um, the president of the bar, because I, it really put you on the map for those of us here in St. Petersburg oh, who is this Miriam Irizarry? Okay, and now you were out in the in the limelight. So, yeah, so it's a, um, it's a nice story, nice story. Uh, yeah. Do you have any role models? Uh, and if so, how did they become your role models? All right. Well, you know, my first role model was my mom, strong Puerto Rican woman who was so determined and s such strength of character and perseverance and really believing in each and each one of us to pursue our dreams. And so, um, but uh, after, after that, um, Judge uh, Nelly Kuzam, uh, who sits on the second DCA, and um, Judge Kuzam, uh, early on when I started trying to become a judge, um, you know, I sought her out and I was a little afraid that she wouldn't have time for me, you know, but um, she was so kind and so patient. And the reason I sought her out is because I had watched her on the bench. And on the bench, oh goodness, she is just so respectful to the people that come before us. She has this great demeanor, this empathetic ear, all of the things that I aspired to be. And so I sought her out and she uh, helped me uh, tremendously through all the years that I was um, trying through the nomination process, uh, giving me encouragement and motivation and you know, each time you don't get selected, you know, you feel like, oh goodness, I can't do this again. But you know, she was right there to say, no, no, you know, just keep going. And, and uh, so, so she has been uh, my mentor. And uh, so when I finally got my judgeship, uh, she uh, swore me in at my investiture. And, uh, and that, that was a proud moment so for her, for me, um and so um yeah i think it's so important to have mentors in your life and i think that uh, i encourage young lawyers to reach out to judges to be mentors for you because first of all we as judges have a responsibility to be mentors and second because it's um you know you never know you may be afraid at first to reach out to a mentor thinking they don't have time for you but 
uh, you know, if you take that leap of faith and you and you take those steps, it's going to, uh, you know, it's, it's going to open great doors for you uh, because you're going to find somebody who truly believes in you the way Judge Kazan believed in me. Understood. So obviously it sounds like you, you uh, believe in the ment- into, believe in mentorships. Are there any type of mentees or interns that you especially enjoy mentoring or, or organizations that you're involved where you provide those type of, um, of uh, mentoring services to people? All right. Well, I especially enjoy mentoring uh, young um, high school college students that are first generation college students getting into college and then uh, college students. Um, I teach as an adjunct at uh, St. Pete College. And so I uh, have been able to uh, mentor many students through that. I've uh, brought them into um, into the courtroom, into the chamber, so that they can observe proceedings and then ask me all kinds of questions afterwards. Um, So I've done a lot of summer internships with um, both high school students and um, college students. I've recruited all of my judicial assistants from that um, um, college pool, uh, particularly um, students that come from disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, who aspire to go to law school so it's an opportunity for them to see the court system from behind the scenes. And uh, so, so it's important to have um, judges that can afford those opportunities. I mean, I, growing up, I did not know a Hispanic judge. I didn't know there was no lawyers in my family. And so uh, being able now to help um, students that were similarly situated to, to me growing up uh, has a, uh, Help tremendously, I think, um, in in um, developing um, the students. So I'm I'm happy to be able to now uh, afford those opportunities to others like this. Well, Your Honor, that uh, that concludes the questions that we had prepared. But if I could just say just briefly that um, you have an amazing story. Um, it is my honor. It is the uh, our, our community is fortunate to have you as part of it and uh, getting to know you, getting to know your background uh, is something that I think that anyone watching this in the future is really going to be impressed with. And so I just wanted to thank you not only on behalf of the St. Petersburg Bar Association, but the entire community here in Pinellas County. So that being mm-hmm. said, I look forward to asking you more questions at the uh, Florida Jurist Recognizing Hispanic Excellent Events uh, coming up. Thank you, Sean. I, I, I appreciate you greatly. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to tell my story and to hopefully uh, impact the lives of, of others. Thank you.